It could. How could 200 pounds hurt you, father? Might drop on his head from the sky, said the frivolous Herbert. Morris said that things happened so naturally, said his father, that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back, said Herbert, as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed, and following him to the door, watched him down the road, and returning to the breakfast table was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said, as they sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, but for all that, the thing moved in my hand, that I'll swear to. You thought it did, said the old lady soothingly. I say it did, replied the other. There was no thought about it. I had just, what's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the 200 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. Page the fourth time he stood with his hand upon it and then with sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same moment placed her hands behind her and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited patiently for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Ma and Megan's. The old lady started. Is anything the matter? She asked breathlessly. Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Her husband interposed. There, there, mother, he said hastily. Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. And he eyed the other wistfully. I'm sorry, began the visitor. Is he hurt? demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. Badly hurt, he said quietly, but he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God, said the old woman, clasping her hands. Thank God for that. Thank... She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath and turning to her slower-witted husband laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery, said the visitor at length in a low voice. Caught in the machinery, repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly 40 years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed and rising walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said, without looking round. I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely obeying orders. Page 39. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring, and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all. But in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand. 
and rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, how much? Two hundred pounds was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. Okay, part two, write it down. So Herbert the son goes off to work. They're joking in the kitchen. A man shows up. I got bad news. Your son got caught in the machinery. He is expired. And the company wishes to give you some money and how much? $200. Um, note, note the ironic line. He was caught in the machinery. Jot down at 2B how that line can be read in two different ways. Caught in the machinery is obviously the way that we know he died. But what else could be caught in the machinery, right? That is to say the realization that this machinery of fate, this notion that things have to work out the way they have to work out, Herbert the son is going to end up jacked, but he didn't have any realization that, that, that it was coming that day. Notice the wife will shriek. Why does she shriek? Write down in your notes why. Is it the death of her son? No, the shriek comes after. The shriek doesn't come when the mother is told your son is, is expired. The shriek comes when the amount of money that's given to her is 200 bones. Now all of a sudden she shrieks, which begs an interesting question. Do you think she shrieks because her son is dead, or do you think she shrieks because she believes that somehow they are responsible for the death of her son by virtue of this wish? I want 200 pounds, and now all of a sudden they get 200 pounds. Of course, already we can jump to 2A and write down one obvious message here of this story, and that is be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you might actually get it. And in getting a wish, you might sometimes lament after the fact, I wish I hadn't wished for this. All right, here we go, part three. Obviously, the, the, the next part of the question of, uh, of this story is, what happens next, right? All right, here we go, pay close attention. Part three of our story. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectation gave place to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back, he said tenderly. You will be cold. It is colder for my son, said the old woman, and wept afresh. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw, she cried wildly, the monkey's paw. He started up in alarm. Where, where is it, what's the matter? She came stumbling across the room toward him. I want it, she said quietly. You've not destroyed it? It's in the parlor, on the bracket, he replied, marveling. Why? She cried and laughed together, and bending over, kissed his cheek. Page 40. I only just thought of it, she said hysterically. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what, he questioned. The other two wishes, she replied rapidly. Right. We've only had one. Was not that enough, he demanded fiercely. No, she cried triumphantly. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again. The man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs. You are mad, he cried aghast. 
Get it, she panted. Get it quickly and wish, oh, my boy, my boy. Her husband struck a match and lit the candle. Get back to bed, he said unsteadily. You don't know what you are saying. We had the first wish granted, said the old woman feverishly. Why not the second? A coincidence, stammered the old man. Go and get it and wish, cried his wife, quivering with excitement. The old man turned and regarded her, and his voice shook. He has been dead ten days, and besides he, I would not tell you else, but I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back, cried the old woman, and dragged him toward the door. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? From the way to Rainy Mountain, by ends. Okay, pause for a moment, and now make sure that you understand what's happening in our story before we now finish with our story, all right? So in other words, Mama says, let's get one more wish. We were allowed three. Let's bring our son back. Good idea, bad idea. The pre the, obviously the prediction. Here we go. Let's now finish the story. He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place, and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him. Right. And he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way around the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish number two. Wish, she cried in a strong voice. It is foolish and wicked, he faltered. Wish, repeated his wife. He raised his hand. I wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank, trembling into a chair, as the old woman with burning eyes walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally Page at the 41. figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward, the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches, and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment, a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. All right, here we go. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended, until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. A rat, said the old man in shaking tones. A rat. It passed me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert, she screamed. It's Herbert. She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do, he whispered hoarsely. It's my boy. It's Herbert, she cried, struggling mechanically. I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go. I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in, cried the old man, trembling. You're afraid of your own son, she cried, struggling. Let me go. I'm coming, Herbert. I'm coming. There was another knock and another. 
The old woman with a sudden wrench broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice strained and panting. The bolt, she cried loudly. Come down, I can't reach it. But her husband was on his hands and knees groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. Now the genius of this story, and students have often pointed out, there's a lot of different elements to the genius of this story. But the genius of the story is to ask some really interesting questions about the ending of the story. Go ahead and jot down at level one for the third part. What do you think was the old man's third wish? Okay, so jot down. What do you think was the third man's, uh, the old man's third wish? Now, some have argued that it's fairly self-evident that the, the wish that the old man wishes for is that, in fact, his son will not be there at the door knocking. Of course, this assumes that, in fact, the son is actually at the door knocking in the first place. Of course, if the son is there knocking, why do you think it would be the case that the father would not want to see his son? Why is it that the mother very much wants to see the son, right? Let's now work at level 2A quickly to try and get a sense of maybe some of the major messages, themes here. One of those we've already mentioned. Be careful what you wish for, you might get it. A second one, though, that's a major theme here is the topic of fate or determinism. Write that term down in your notes at 2A. Determinism. The philosophic notion that, and it comes often in the form of a question, how really free are humans? Is your life determined by fate? That's where we get determined. That's where we get our term determinism from. That is to say, to what degree do you have any freedom or choice in the world? A word picture to describe this might be a baseball that could talk out loud, and somebody throws it through the air, and the baseball says out loud, I'm really happy I chose to fly today. Looked at from another perspective, of course, we go, no, 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 no. You did not choose to fly. You were thrown. You had absolutely nothing to do with your fly. Of course, we as humans like to think that we have freedom, that we can make our own choices. Of course, ironically, for you to say I am free and can make my own choice, you speak in a language which you did not choose to learn, but rather was given to you from the moment of your conception. It does beg some interesting questions. How free are we actually? To what degree does this story speak at all about freedom and choices? Notice the father said it was just coincidence. We didn't kill our own son by making that choice. To what degree do you think this story speaks to that? If we were to go to 3 uh, or to 2B really quickly, let's make a couple of quick observations. One, we have identifiable plot elements here. We have an exposition, don't we? Let me ask you this question. Jot it down at 2B. What for you is the central conflict of this story? Is it an internal conflict character versus self? Or is it some kind of external conflict character versus another character? Character versus nature? Character versus society and idea? Some students will say all of those care conflicts are somehow assumed in this story. Definitely you have a father who is in conflict with himself after the death of his son. Definitely you have a conflict of character versus character between the father and the mother. She's saying, let's use our second wish to appropriate the life of our son returned. He's saying, absolutely not. You could argue that you have the conflict of character versus nature in the supernatural elements. 
the paw that is mummified, a disgusting monkey's paw, moves or wiggles, he swears, that he felt it move or wiggle, right? Character versus nature. Character versus an idea, of course, this notion that you should never mess around with the dead, you should never come back, bringing people back from the dead is bad business, it almost always seems to kind of end in something really bad happening. All of those conflicts are assumed in this one little story, it's quite an amazing story. Of course, we could also ask about symbolism. Jot this one down. What does the monkey's paw represent for you in the story? Does it represent fate? Does it represent bad choices or poor choices? Or maybe we would say uninformed choices, right? We make our choices, but we often don't understand the ramifications. All right, let's jump to 3A really quickly. What is for you a text that immediately comes to mind that you can relate this one with? Do you have a text... Yeah, from your life that plays the game of trying to somehow get beyond this idea of death or fooling death. Do you have any of those kind of movies? And how does that usually work out in those movies? What about the wishes motif? You're probably familiar, of course, with the Aladdin, we, Arabian Nights, right? The Thousand and One Nights or the Arabian Nights, right? That is to say, this notion that you could get three wishes. What's your favorite text where wishes are provided and then someone ends up getting what he or she wished for and it ends up being something not so good at all. Do you have any video games, by the way, that kind of play with that, that notion as well? Finally, a 3B question. You knew this one was coming, right? If you could be given three wishes and no wishing for more wishes, what would those three wishes be for you? Can you even write down what those wishes would be? And is a story like this a propedeutic, didactic, instructional, to suggest you've got to be very careful with what wishes you ask for?